Thank you all for having me. My name is John Wathen. I'm a part of the Waterkeeper Alliance. We're an international federation of groups around the world that believe that clean water is a human right. We all have a right to clean water. We all have a right to go and catch fish from that water and not have to worry about what toxins are in the flesh of that fish that can harm us or our children. Those rights have been stolen from us around the world. That's why water keepers exist today, to champion the rights for clean water for everyone. I'm a photojournalist from America. I was sent to the Gulf of Mexico. I work for the Waterkeeper magazine. I was sent there to collect evidence and data so that we could get an accurate picture of what was actually going on out there in the Gulf. I didn't arrive while the fires were burning. I got there a few days later. So what I'm going to tell you about is the beginning of a horror story for the Gulf of Mexico that may go on for the next 50 years. There's no way of knowing how long this is going to take place because we're just now beginning to experience some of the real negative impacts of the deep water horizon. Anadarko, uh, it was a sister company of BP. When I talk about BP, make that connection because they are. They were 25% owners in this rig that blew up. It was their cowboy mentality that caused this. It could have been prevented. It should have been prevented. And because of what you see in that, right, that picture right there, 11 men didn't go home. 11 fathers, 11 cousins, 11 brothers were lost at sea because of this disaster. And it was nothing more than greed driven. This is what the Gulf of Mexico looked like when I got there. Um, at this point, the, the well was still flowing free. When I flew over it, for the first time in my life, I used the words hopeless. I've always been a person who thought that we could overcome if we just worked together. But in this case, it was hopeless. We were not going to stop this from coming on our shores. This well ran completely uncontained for 87 days because we didn't have a plan. The only plan that BP had was to drill for oil. Our contingency plan for a disaster was a knee-jerk plan. Let's try this. If it don't work, let's try this. Do something, even if it's wrong. That was our plan. And you have a plan here in New Zealand that's even worse than that. You're not ready for what's going to happen to you if there's a disaster such as what we experienced in the Gulf of Mexico. What you see up here... I'm give a little pointer. In this far corner of the screen, those specks up there, those are not just dust specks. Those are ships on the horizon. Those are big vessels that were put out there to contain this oil spill. And we failed miserably. You don't have any such vehicles here. This is a processing boat. The two on this side are uh, trawlers and they're pulling a long boom between each boat that funnels the oil into this processor where it's supposed to remove the oil and let the water come out the back of the boat cleaner than what it was when it went in. But if you look, you see a trail leaving the boat that's just as dirty as any of this out here. It failed. This is the most readily available technology out there and it was a complete disaster. This is two of our fishing trawlers. They're pulling this boom between them to gather the oil off the surface. And this is before the dispersant was added to the water. I'm going to talk to you in depth a little bit about the dispersant. But as I go through this, I want you to pay attention to these vivid colors that are in the water because it's going to change. What these guys are doing is collecting this oil into pools that are just about the same size as a city block here in Wellington. Then they fire a flare into it and they set it on fire. This is a picture of the flyers. We actually flew the airplane under the smoke columns and shot back up into the sun and it completely obliterated the sun. These fires, the fires themselves, were as much as four to five stories high. The smoke cloud went 4,500 feet in the air. We followed it with an airplane we followed this all the way back to the state of Florida, 150 miles from the disaster site. We were still seeing black smoke in the clouds. Another thing to pay attention to is up here behind the smoke, 
you can see these white billowy clouds. These are thunderheads. You don't see thunderheads normally at sea like this. You see a thunderhead over a beach. You see a thunderhead where the sun is reflecting back into the clouds, causing turbulence. There was so much oil on the surface, and the heat from these, these fires was generating its own weather pattern. At this point, the rain that was coming from the Gulf of Mexico is going all over the southeastern United States, and it was causing acid rain that actually killed a lot of our crops. This is a sad picture. This is a pod of dolphins. That's dolphins all in here. Every one of these holes that you see are where they've come to the air, come to the surface to take a breath of air. Anytime you see oil with this rainbow color on it, it's off-gassing. It's giving off toxic fumes that would be comparison to you or I sticking our head into a gasoline tank and trying to breathe it. And yet the dolphins, they were in there. They had no choice. They died. The fires I showed you, when they collected those booms up full of oil, if there were sea turtles, birds, dolphins, whales, whatever was collected in those booms was burned at sea. Because there's a fine in America. It's a federal offense to kill a sea turtle in America. It's, I think, about a $5,000 fine. But if there's no body count, there's no fine. It's always negotiable in the courts. If you've been following any of what's going on in our country, in New Orleans, Louisiana right now, there's a big court case going on between BP, Anadarko, their partners, and the United States government. As long as there's no accurate facts, then the penalty will always be negotiable. And it could go on for years and years and years before our people are made whole, if they're ever made whole, if that's possible. This is a pod of dolphins that are swimming into the oil, actually. A dolphin's instinct is so powerful. They have to get to the Chandelure Islands where they breed, where they have their babies, where they eat, where they, where they, they nurture their young in the Chandelures. Their instinct is so strong that they swim into this disaster with no real comprehension that you know, this could very well be the last breath they took in some cases. On this day, I saw and photographed over a hundred dolphins that were either dead, dying, or in extreme distress. They were flipping around on top of the water like a minnow in a bucket with no oxygen in the water. We don't know exactly how many died because we don't know exactly how many were burned at sea. So you got a big problem coming if there's a disaster here. This is a whale. And he too, his instinct was so powerful that this whale is swimming into the rainbow sheen. And again, as long as you see the rainbow, this stuff is off-gassing. It's causing toxic vapors where this whale has to breathe. The day that this was taken, when that whale came to the surface and he breached to blow and to breathe, there was blood down his back. This whale was hemorrhaging at the time the photograph was taken. The next day, at this general GPS location, there was a whale found dead. We don't know if it was this one or not. I would like to think so, as opposed to thinking that there were many more out there that were also impacted like this. But I know for a fact that this boy was swimming, this whale, excuse me, this, this whale was swimming in a very toxic environment because his instinct drove him there. You can't tell them, don't go. This is what the surface looked like during that time. And once again, these are very large ships on the horizon. These are not tiny little boats. We had, uh, uh, we had boats of that description, probably as many as 200 working at one time. There were thousands counting our shrimp fleet, our, our trawlers that were pulling booms around in the water, trying to collect this stuff up with no place to dispose of it. In, in Bayou Barataria, in, in the Chandelure Sound. They were pulling the booms, gathering the oil up, but we couldn't find a collection vessel anywhere. We flew around on this day. We flew for six and a half hours over the water and never once flew over clean water, and we never saw a collection vessel in association with our shrimp trawlers. This boat right in the middle 
if you'll notice, there's a patch of clearer, more clear water right around in this area. That's where the Corexit was being administered. Corexit, once again, is a dispersing agent that is used to hide the oil. It doesn't clean it up. Don't let them come here and tell you that Corexit will fix it. Corexit simply hides it. Out of sight, out of mind, the penalty is negotiable. They pay a penalty based on the barrel of oil that's lost at sea <coughs> that they can prove. But if they can't prove how much was lost, then the penalty is never completely assessed and our people will never be made whole. This is the Breton Island Sound. This is the Breton Island right here. All of these specks in here are brown pelicans. They're white pelicans. They're egrets. Thousands and thousands of birds come to these rookeries every year. It's one of the richest rookeries in the world. Well, they come here for safe harbor. They build their nest here. They lay eggs here. They raise their young here. But this is what the islands looked like when the oil got there. This is all crude oil. It's washed up into our marshland. The white booming that you see around the outside here, this is absorbent boom. It's meant to collect the oil. It causes it to absorb into the boom so that it could be removed from the water. Unfortunately, though, it didn't get done that way. If you look back up in here, you'll see that same boom laying back in the marsh in huge piles of it. This is, these, these are not logs. These are not trees. That's, that's the absorbent boom. When the collection vessels came around, if that boom was not visible from the boat, it didn't get picked up. And we have miles of this stuff left in our marshland today that's still giving off oil. So, you know, there's really no way to contain the disaster once it starts. The drilling technology has advanced considerably. We have a great deal more knowledge now about drilling these holes, but the response technology is the same antiquated technology that they used in Ixtoc, Mexico, and in the, in the Prince William Sound when the Exxon Valdez ran aground. In, in Prince William Sound, the whiting population still today has not come back. That was nearly 30 years ago. It was well over 20 years ago that the Exxon Valdez ran aground. So, you know, to say that capping the well in the Gulf of Mexico fixed our problem, that's a fallacy. That's, this is only the beginning of the horror story that will unfold throughout the rest of my lifetime and possibly my grandchildren's lifetime. We're far from being over with this in the Gulf of Mexico. This is another shot of the marshland. All of these white sticks out here in the water, those are oyster pots. Our fishermen were told, you either go out there and you collect this stuff and you put it on the market, or you're voluntarily giving up your wages and we don't have to compensate you. So our fishermen were left with the position of either go out there and fish in these toxic waters or do without. The other alternative was that you could become a boat in the VU program, Vessels of Opportunity. The Vessels of Opportunity were our shrimp fleet. And those guys went out there with the best of intentions. They're the locals. They're the people who rely on that moana for their life. It's their culture. It, it's, it's everything to them. Some of them raise their grandchildren on their boats out there, teaching them how to fish, how to read the navigation points in the water. They teach them from the water how to live with the water. So all of this is in toxic is a very toxic situation. These boats back in here were drugged back up into the marshes and anchored down and they had devices in them that were cannons basically. They had propane tanks with a barrel on them. It allows a little bit of propane in there. They set it off, boom, it goes off like a cannon and scares the birds away from the rookery. Those birds are instinctive, just like the dolphins and the whales. They're going to come back when the noise is over, and the marshes are still toxic. So this is an insane program. What we did to our marshes was a crime. The drill plan that I've seen here is even more insane. This is without a doubt one of the most insane drill plans I've ever seen in my life. The waters in the Gulf of Mexico are much calmer than what you have here. 
um, it's not as deep. The waters here are much colder. This is a recipe for disaster if it's allowed to go on here. I can't say without a doubt that there will be a disaster. But I can say that in my lifetime, I've never seen an oil field that didn't have some type of major incident at some time or another. Why take the chance if you don't have to? This is a picture of those marshlands up close. This is the oil on the water. This is a gentleman in his airboat that went out there with the media to take the pictures and all. And you can see from the marsh grass where it's gone up and down several times with the tide. What happened is this oil came in contact with the marsh grass, it killed it, it burned the roots to the grass to where it's gone away. These islands are not like the islands here that are rock-based. These are sand-based islands. They're sedimentary. So when you remove the, sand, the, the, the vegetation, the grass dies off, a lot of these islands have virtually gone away. They've diminished. They sunk into the ocean because there was nothing to hold them there. That means our hurricane buffer zone is now depleted. We're, we're, we're susceptible to more high tide from the, from the hurricanes that come in. We're more susceptible to the high winds that come in. This is a recipe for disaster that we created in America through apathy and greed. Our people believed everything the government told them. We believed everything the oil company said. I've never seen an extraction company yet oil, coal, gas, any of them, that don't come into the community saying, we're going to be good neighbors. We're going to take care of you. Nothing's going to happen, and if it does, we'll fix it. Excuse me, folks, but that's a load of fertilizer. They can't fix it once it breaks. It's broken forever. This is one of our brown pelicans. It, that's the species, not the color from the oil. The brown pelicans, we, they were almost at one time, they were on a... a, a an endangered list. They're just beginning to resurge back into the, the rookeries, and we did this to them. Thousands of these birds were taken out of the Gulf. They were cleaned. Where they did everything possible to rehabilitate, and they were able to rehabilitate some of these birds. But then they had to release them back into a toxic environment where they've got cannons on the island to scare them away. What have we done? Don't let this happen in New Zealand. Dispersing agent. I told you I'd talk more about Corexit. This is the product right here. Corexit 9527A, owned by a company called Nalco. Nalco is owned by BP. Yeah. Corexit is a chemical <coughs> that's removed from crude oil. In its natural state, this chemical is a part of that crude oil. It causes the oil to break down in nature. It causes it to weather into a completely inert product to where you can take tar balls, real tar balls, you can hold it in your hand and it just sits there. You can take and put a lighter under it and it drips like candle wax, but it will not burn. Once you put this stuff in the oil, this is the chemical that's removed from the oil to make it viscous. It makes it stick to the steel parts in your engine. Without it, the oil breaks down. So we've got warehouses full of this very toxic solvent and nothing to do with it, right? It's outlawed in Europe. It's outlawed in England where BP is from. But it's not outlawed in America and it's, a, it's the number one listed response in New Zealand to an oil spill is dump corrects it on it. This stuff, when it's added back to the oil, it doesn't make it go away. It breaks it down and makes it sink to the bottom of the ocean where it lays there in these huge tar mats that wash up on our beaches. We're still having oil wash up on our beaches today. This year, right now, three years later, we're still having oil wash up on our beaches in a very toxic form. Uh, Hurricane Ivan just hit, uh, hit the uh, Barataria area, the town of Lafitte, uh, Lafouche, all of these communities in there were coated, once again, on dry land. They were coated with this, this Corexit laced concoction, you know, this, this cocktail of disaster. The Nalco, uh, I mean, the, they said they weren't using this stuff.
but we found whole fields of it that were hidden back in the marshes, hidden behind fences. And they, they, you know, they, they lied to us, and they're going to continue lying to us. Remember I told you earlier to, to, to pay attention to the color of the water, how vivid the bright colors were in those early photographs I showed? Now look at it. It's purple. It's dense, but it's sinking below the surface. You don't see the rainbow anymore. It's going beneath the, uh, the boom here. It can't be burned. This is, this is what happens after the correxit is added. It causes it to sink out of sight. That's all. It doesn't make it go away. It's still there. BP says, and, and, and Anadarko, all of the oil companies, they say that it's as safe as Dawn dishwash. Okay, think about this. Do you want to eat a fish that's been swimming around in Dawn dishwash? Do you want your children to go swimming in Dawn dishwash? I don't think so. I don't want to eat food that's coming out of that. This is more about what it looks like here. When the correxit is added to it, you see it's part of the water now. It's not on top of the water. This foam is characteristic of the correxit when it's added in there. It, it agitates. It comes up a lot like soap suds on top of the water. But once it's in the water, it will evaporate into the air that's where our main weather generation comes from, is the Gulf of Mexico. You may have heard about the big tornado that hit Oklahoma just this last week. That weather pattern came out of the Gulf of Mexico. Once it's in the water, it will evaporate into the clouds, and it will rain back down on us. When this happened, I had a nice garden. I love my fresh veggies. You know, who doesn't like fresh corn, fresh beans, fresh peas and all? My corn developed big black spots on the leaves. The ears were mealy-like. They, they didn't have that sweet, fresh taste of corn. We wouldn't even eat it. My beans, you couldn't snap them. They were like rubber. It didn't, the whole garden failed that year. And this happened all along the southeastern United States. We lost a lot of crops that year. So imagine when this, if this were to happen here, people, uh, the sheep farmers, your sheep have to eat the grass. The cows, they have to eat the grass that this stuff will eventually fall on. Everything becomes toxic at that point. In the Gulf of Mexico, we thought, well, I just want to eat the shrimp. I won't eat the fish, and I'll be okay. But Menhaden is one of the uh, biggest cash crops in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a feedstock product. They, set, they, they feed it to our hogs. They feed it to the poultry industry. So when I carve my turkey on Thanksgiving Day, I'm eating Gulf of Mexico seafood, like it or not. And that was done to our, to our entire country. People inland had no idea what was going on. This is what the Gulf of Mexico looked like on July the 3rd. July 3rd is a big holiday, uh, July the 4th rather, is a big holiday in the United States. It's our uh, Independence Day. Millions of people come to our beaches to swim, to eat seafood, to drink a few beers, have a party. This is what our Gulf of Mexico looked like. What they did is they came in and they took sand off of one end of the beach, covered over the oil so our tourists wouldn't see it, and they invited them to come on down, have a party on our Gulf of Mexico. All of this brown in here, that's the oil with Corexit, the foam that I told you about earlier. It's all out in this water where these people are out there swimming. Our beaches should be sugar white. We're renowned for having sugar white beaches along the emerald coast of Florida. You know, these colors jump out in your mind when you talk about them, but they're gone. They're gone because of a simple act of greed caused a disaster like this. These people don't know just how, bad they're, how badly they're taking a chance of becoming very, very ill. This guy went swimming. We had signs all over our beach that said, don't go in the water. You may or may not see the oil, but if you do see oil, contact us. If you go swimming, take a shower, wash it off. Don't use uh, harsh detergents because it'll cause even further absorption into the skin. This young man went swimming. He did exactly what they told him to do. He took a shower and then was brought out and put under an ultraviolet light. 
corrects it in oil, corrects it mixed with oil, shows up under the ultraviolet light like these spots right here. So you see he's covered with this stuff. And that's the result. These lesions on that girl's leg were caused from going swimming in the Gulf of Mexico, although our doctors will never admit to that because of the insurance possibilities. BP has put millions and millions of dollars on many tables to make sure that the truth doesn't come out like about this. But this was common. We had it all over the coast. I've got lesions on my own arms that, uh, for the most part, I thought had healed up. Recently, I've got another one breaking open. Once it starts, there's no way of really knowing how long they'll last. Um, they, used, just, they used antibiotics on this that people normally would use for MRSA and staph infection, but it didn't work. It doesn't make it go away. We don't know what we're going to be toxified with and how long this is going to last. It's a, it, th these are things that can be researched. You can check out some of our websites along the Gulf of Mexico. People all over the, all over the Gulf are talking about their children being sick. It causes respiratory problems, heart problems, headaches, nausea. Our shrimp fleet was sprayed with this stuff from an aircraft. We had to call in 100 boats off the line one night, and men were in hospitals all over the coast because they were sprayed directly with the Corexit. And the, 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 the uniform diagnosis along the coast, the doctors were coming out saying, well, it's probably food poisoning. Excuse me, a hundred different boats, a hundred different cooks, and all of these guys are sick with food poisoning? Something's wrong with this scenario. July the 4th, when the sun came out, I told you about them covering the sand, covering the oil with fresh sand. When the sun came out, these were like little miniature oil volcanoes that just came bubbling up out of the sand. And anywhere water stood on the beach from the tide, this is what it looked like, and our people are out there swimming in that. We still have these oil mats in the beaches today. You can go to Pensacola, Florida and take a post hole digger. You can dig three meters down into the sand, and you come up with Corexit. It never really goes away. It's absorbing itself into our beaches. Here along the New Zealand coastline, you have a lot of rocky coastlines. So it's not going to be able, they're not going to be able to wash this away. It'll just simply sink down farther out of sight and keep coming back over time. It's not going to go away. We were so ill prepared for this. And we're supposed to be one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world when it comes to drilling. We failed miserably because the technology to respond to disasters hasn't followed the technology to drill the holes. If you can't control the flow, don't drill the hole. That's the rule I think we should all be living by anywhere in the world. This is a dolphin, a fully matured dolphin, belly up. This was one of many. We had hundreds of dolphins that, that died. In the first year, we had, uh, I think there was like 160, 170 dolphins that washed up on our beaches. The next year, the ones that survived and were able to have babies, their children were weakened. The young from these dolphins were weakened to the point where some of them didn't make it. The next year, the third generation, which was predicted to us by Dr. Ricky Ott, a marine toxicologist who was in the Exxon Valdez disaster. She's been in Prince William Sound studying this since it happened. She told us, in three years' time, you'll see the decline of your fisheries. You'll see the death of some of these species completely. This is a fully matured dolphin. That's a baby. This is a woman's shoe, to give you an idea of the size. This dolphin was probably stillborn or died within just a short time after it was born. Now the count is up over 600 of these dolphins that have washed up on our shore. And it's getting more and more frequent that you find the young and stillborn. This is exactly what was predicted to us. So, you know, these are things that you can research on your own, but it's true. It's happening to us right now. That's a picture of the fish. This is a snapper with lesions that are very, very similar to the ones that I had along with several others around the coast that had these lesions. 
I know a young man who was a perfectly healthy specimen of a United States Marine. He was in great physical condition. He went swimming in the Gulf of Mexico several times before he was going to ship out to go overseas, and he is now in a wheelchair. He has the same lesions in his brain. He goes through seizures at times that are so severe they have to stretch him out on the floor and people actually have to sit on him to keep him from convulsing and hurting himself. He was not sick before he went swimming in that corexit. The prawn at the top, we call them shrimp, but these are cancerous tumors that are growing on the outside of that prawn. On the inside of its head, a lot of them are coming up with parasites inside the heads of these prawns. Also, if you notice, there's no eyes. Not where, the, not, not, not where the eyes were pulled off in the nets. There's no eye sockets. They are mutants now of what they once were. Crabs with black lungs and holes in their shells. Imagine that in Kayakwata. Think about, think about the, the kaimwana that's here, the seafood that comes out of these oceans with this coming in on it. You know, this is, this is very, very dangerous business. That's a close-up of one of the snapper that was brought in. The lesions on that fish are pretty severe. This is what our beach looks like March of this year. The oil is still coming on shore. It's still coming on shore in big quantities. This water is just as toxic as it was on July the 3rd, 2010. It's coming back every time the tide surges a bit. We get a tropical storm that comes in. It brings that oil up out of the canyons and trenches and dumps it back on our beaches. We can expect this for years and years and years to come. I'm told that it could be as much as 50 years before the seafood in the Gulf of Mexico ever has a resurgence and comes back to what it once was. I doubt that that's even true. So this is, this is a recipe for disaster. We did this to ourselves through sheer apathy of the American people not paying attention to what happened to us not paying attention to the one well that was started back at the turn of the century, we now have something like 4,000 of them out there. So think about this as it goes. I'm going to introduce you in this next slide to a young lady named Kendra Arneson. Kendra uh, was not an environmental activist. She came from a fishing family that lives in one of the most southernmost cities in the United States. They were the closest to the disaster when it occurred. Her husband is a commercial fisherman. Her daughter is nine years old. Uh, they're all having some extreme problems from this. And I want you to listen to what Kendra has to say. It's, it's a heart-wrenching story, but it's one that I feel like you really ought to hear. Kendra Arneson. Kendra Arneson. Kendra comes from Plaquemine Parish, from a shrimper family. Uh, what she has experienced over the past year and a half uh, is both uh, traumatic and shocking. If you could just pass the mic down to Kendra there. Thank you. The official story is that no one is sick, the seafood is safe, the oil is gone, and everyone's been made whole. I personally have been fighting a skin infection since the end of May of 2010. I've been on several rounds of antibiotics, and now daily, on a daily basis, I wash my skin with an antimicrobial soap. Um, my husband and nine-year-old little girl have been ill every four to six weeks. David is my husband. since He's been ill since May 2010. And Alina, my daughter, since September 2010. Along with a high fever and upper respiratory infections, my little girl is suffering with chest pains and breathing issues. Um, as of April 2011, our elementary school only has 400 kids. We have a closet full of nebulizers. I'm sorry. With only 400 children in attendance at our school, many also have skin infections along with these breathing issues. Last month, I received four notices in seven days of different skin infections. With our kids, what is going on? We um, 
I look at my children and I don't know what their future may be. My six-year-old seems fine, but I have to wonder, am I going to be in a hospital in six or seven years with my daughter with her hair falling out? I'm going to move on. The seafood safe? I'm not so sure. Fishermen have caught shrimp with their eyes, shrimp with larvae hatching inside their head. In deep water, fish of many different species have a black sludge in their stomach. The substance appears to be seeping into the meat of the fish. The oysters, from what I've heard, are not spatting as they should. Crabs are showing deformities. We have sent fresh samples to both NOAA and LSU, only to have them disappear. As most know, oil washes in on a daily basis. Most are unaware of the fresh oil our deep water fishermen pass through every day, only to be exposed again. Being made whole would be great if it were true or even possible. However, we have yet to be made whole, and we probably never will be. Our government has allowed BP to rob us of our health, our home, our fishery, our heritage, and our future. My family and I are going to have to move. I can stay here no longer. Kendra's story is one of many along the Gulf Coast that are continuing today. Many of our citizens are having to leave the coast because they can't tolerate the, the health effects that are taking place. They're having to abandon their homes. They're having to abandon their way of life. Their culture has been stolen from them by a bunch of greedy fat cats that now want to come into your waters and take the same chances with your Moana. And I beg you, don't let this happen to New Zealand. I'm John Wathen. I'm your Hurricane Creek Keeper. I'm part of the Waterkeeper Alliance. I have a blog site up called BP Slick. Check it out, BP Slick. Easy, easy to remember, that goes in any Google search engine will bring up my blog site and go back and view some of the videos that I've collected over time, the photographs that I've posted. These are real stories from real people in the Gulf of Mexico today. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to turn it back over to Mike now. He's got a few more details for you.